Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. Frank Florio, certified legal intern from the University of Miami. On behalf of the appellant, Ms. Kalisha Comier, I'm here with my supervising attorney, Keely Stewart, and I'd please like to request two minutes for a rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honors, we respectfully request that this court reverse the hearing officer's decision to deny Ms. Comier education and training voucher benefits. This case involves the denial of a young girl to receive federal funds for her post-secondary education after aging out of foster care. The hearing officer here erroneously applied narrower eligibility requirements for ETV to Kalisha than the federal statute required. The relevant federal eligibility requirements to receive the can ETV I, can voucher. Can I stop you for a moment I, because I'd like you to clarify for me under which um, program um, CC was attempting to receive benefits because under the ETV program, apparently there are three separate programs that utilize those funds. Um, and they're identified as the basic education and training voucher, uh, the road to independence, which apparently went out, out of effect in 2014, and then the post-secondary educational services and support, which is PESS, P-E-S-S. Under which of these programs uh, are you traveling under? The basic ETV, Your Honor. Kalisha, the basic ETV. Uh, to the record um, at 504 and 506, uh, Kalisha applies for ETV, and there are separate checks boxes there. And, and that's there. what her application actually circled, that that was the benefit she was seeking. Yes, Your so Honor. So we don't look at PESS, we don't look at any of that. Correct, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, the relevant federal eligibility requirements to receive the federal ETV voucher that the child must have aged out of foster care and sought post-secondary education or training. However, Florida's administrative rule adds three requirements that are not in the federal law. First, the child must have been in foster care for six months. Second, the child must have been adjudicated dependent. And third, the child must have been in licensed care. However, Your Honors, it's undisputed that Kalisha meets the federal requirements to receive the ETV voucher. So the legal question here is, does the state of Florida even have the authority to narrow the federal eligibility requirements? And the answer is no. And in fact, this court addressed this issue in a case, a 2005 case, CF versus the Department of Children and Families. There, Florida's rule defining the term medically necessary was narrower than under the federal Medicaid law. The effect of that rule excluded a disabled child from receiving medical services. Well, in, in CF, it appears to me that the, the critical language is that it, it said it held that the hearing officer could not apply state and department definitions of medical necessity and personal care assistance more narrowly than what the federal law requires. Yes, and I think that word requires is critical to our analysis. Because when you go back to current Quern, which is from the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court specifically held that if the act or federal law does not impose mandatory eligibility standards on the states that elect to participate, the state is not precluded from receiving uh, federal funds simply because it limits eligibility requirements more narrowly. So in Quirin, it appears the, the U.S. Supreme Court is saying that you have to look to see whether there's mandatory language, which in CF, it appears that when they looked at the federal law, it had that mandatory language because it required certain things. Do you find that same mandatory language um, in in the uh, rule that applied at the time that she applied for the benefits? Yes, Your Honor, because the um, Chafee Act does not speak to any other eligibility requirements or delegate any authority to any state to impose any other narrower eligibility requirements, we find that that language for eligibility under Chafee is mandatory. And to your point about Quirin, Your Honor, there's an important distinction between Quirin and the case here. The eligibility requirements in Quirin did not apply to the overarching AFDC program, but to a separately designated emergency assistance program. And additionally, that emergency assistance eligibility requirements were extremely broad, and therefore the states were given flexibility to narrow the requirements. And the court specifically in Quirin stated and made it very clear that the states would not have been able to narrow the eligibility requirements for that broader AFDC statute. So how should we interpret that portion of the federal act which, uh, which says under B2E that the state shall use objective criteria for determining eligibility for benefits and services under the programs 
and for ensuring fair and equitable treatment of benefit recipients. Yes. To what extent does that give discretion to the states to uh, apply this six-month six requirement? It gives no. It gives no discretion to the state for specifically for ETV there. The E6 or the E uh, requirement that you referred to, Your Honor, refers to the Chafee Act in general, which was intended to help older foster care children in the system. Um, in 2002, Congress amended the Chafee Act to create the ETV program, and these eligibility requirements specifically for ETV are what ap apply. The flexibility that DCF argues for. Um, and that the states are granted in the Chafee Act is not flexibility in determining eligibility. But, but doesn't the Chafee Act actually give the states the authority to set objective criteria for eligibility for ETV funding? No, Your Honor. The only thing that the, that the, that the Chafee Act speaks to specifically for ETV are that the child must have been, has to age out of foster care and has sought post secondary education and training. The objective criteria itself did not refer to eligibility but so, the so if a child was in foster care for eight hours and then turned 18 eight hours later you would be making the same argument you're making here today yes your honor the amount of time in foster care um, is not applicable because one minute one minute before midnight makes no difference yes your honor because the support system that children are taken away from by merely entering into the foster care system. Even if they're taken away from that support system for a minute? Correct, because now they're deemed unsupported by family or guardians because they've been taken away for uh, but, abuse. But even if they're taken away based upon an allegation of abuse or allegation of drugs in the home or some, some allegation, and for the protection of the child, they remove the child from the home, place the child in a licensed care facility, while they investigate the claim and they find that the claim was unfounded and return the child back to the home with no further state action, it's your position that that child would be entitled to ETV funding simply because that child had been placed under, in a licensed care facility while they investigated the claim, maybe for a day or two days. Right, and if they aged out, Your Honor, yes, it's our contention that if they've aged out under the federal eligibility requirements, that's all it contends. Now, a state, the state cannot exempt them completely from the pool. They have to, under the federal eligibility requirements, allow the children to get into the pool. If there's some other mitigating factor after the fact, some type of design there, maybe. We don't want to put anything in the state of Florida's mouth, but that could possibly be it. But as long as it doesn't restrict the children from reaching the federal eligibility. So, so to, to your so honor's to take point, this yes. to the extreme, and it applies a little bit in this case because CC, after aging out, left the country for a year and didn't apply for these benefits until she was 19 and a half. But let's take the analysis to the extreme and let's say based upon an allegation of abuse, and, and in this case I don't think it was simply an allegation, it was probably a founded allegation, but let's assume for a moment it was investigated, she was placed in a, a licensed facility, which did not happen in this case, although I think she was sheltered for two days, so that must have been a licensed facility. But let's assume for a moment she's placed in a licensed facility for a day or two while they investigate the claim, they find that the claim was unfounded. She then leaves the country for a couple of years, comes back maybe when she's 19 or 20, and now wants benefits. It's your position that she would be entitled to those benefits simply because at the time she was in that sheltered care, she aged out. Yes, Your Honor. And, it's, and to two points to that specifically. Um, the purpose of the act deeming that a child is in foster care. They've been taken away from their family or guardian. Now the support for these children are the state, and in this case, the Department of Children and Family. When they age out of the system, they've now lost the family and guardianship support. They've now lost the support of the state. For so a day or two. For a day or two, Your Honor. Under the federal eligibility requirements, it does. And we can take the extreme to the other side that Florida's uh, eligibility requirements for six months, 180 days, would therefore then preclude someone like Kalisha if she was in foster care for 70 days, or for someone like Kalisha, that what happened here to the facts of this case, that one of the, the second standard in Florida under the rule is to be adjudicated dependent. Her adjudication proceedings were delayed by a continuance from an attorney. That's under no fault of her own. So, Your Honor, if to read into the statute itself 
that a state may apply these eligibility requirements when it's not explicitly there makes the application of the statute arbitrary. Kalisha could go to Georgia then well, and but possibly I, I don't be think there. Under Quern, what we're doing is adding the may language to the statute. What we're looking at is whether there's mandatory language within the statute. And I have not seen any mandatory in language, and perhaps you can point point me to the mandatory eligibility stand, uh, standards um, that you contend are, are within the rule itself. Well, Your Honor, specifically to subsection A6, that's the amended language in the statute for ETV in 2002. Okay, I'm and saying, under, under what are you traveling under, the rule? The Chafee Act itself, the statute. Oh, the, okay, yes. under the Chafee Act, you're traveling under subsection what? A6. A6? That was added when ETV was created and amended into the statute in 2002. It says to make available vouchers for education training, including post-secondary training and education to youths who have aged out of foster care. Right, and in subsection A above, it says the purpose of this section is to provide states with flexible funding that will enable programs to be designed and conducted and then sets the eligibility requirements and the purpose for. If you look at the statute, that part of the statute there, it shows what the flexibility is and is enabling the programs and the design and the design of the program. But, but, but then where's it says, the language that says that the state must provide these services to any child who's been in foster care? Or does it simply leave that determination as to the eligibility requirements to the states? That is the only language that speaks to eligibility and therefore we, we read into the statute that there is, since there's no other explicitly spoken language that well, a state may determine. Well, if you look under, under subsection 2, under state plan, 2E, well, it says, it begins with, a plan meets the requirements of this paragraph if the plan specifies which state agency or agencies will administer, supervise, or oversee the programs carried out under the plan and describe how the state intends to do the following. A, design and deliver programs to achieve the purpose of the section, and E, use objective criteria for determining eligibility for benefits and services under the program and for ensuring fair and equitable treatment of benefit recipients. Doesn't that language seem to suggest that because the state is permitted to use objective criteria in determining the eligibility uh, for benefits, that there is no mandatory eligibility requirement? It's our contention, as I spoke to Judge Emis's point with that Section E, that that objective criteria with the eligibility is referring to the broader Chafee Act itself and not specifically. But isn't that more the permissible scope and then it leaves it up to the states to then determine the specific eligibility within that permissible scope? Well, as I stated, Your Honor, if that was the case, it would leave the statute and give it an absurd meaning, absurd meaning and make it arbitrary from state to state. So now these children that age out of foster care, one state could have their own set of eligibility requirements. Another one could have eligibility requirements. But if the federal government thought that that was unacceptable, then why would it approve Florida's program? You know, they have to submit the, the program, or the plan for approval, and this was approved by the federal government, which approves the plan submitted by all of the states. So the federal agency, HHS, that approved the plan was approving Florida's implementation of the act, not the eligibility. And even if it were, a federal agency cannot override federal eligibility requirements via the approval of a state plan. That's not the type of federal action like rulemaking or adjudication that gets the type of deference to then override provisions in a federal statute. And we cite to Bowen versus Georgetown, a Supreme Court case, specifically for that premise. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll give you two minutes to rebuttal. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please the court, my name is Jacqueline Curlin. I'm from the Office of the Attorney General and recommend, uh, represent the uh, department. The department did not reversibly err in its denial of Pellant's ETV application. Parties both agree that the purpose of the, ET, the Chafee ETV funds is to provide flexible funding for states to design and develop programs to youths who have aged out of foster care as set forth in uh, U.S. Code 677. I'd like to ask you this question because it's unclear to me, but uh, in two, uh, effective in January of 2017, the rule was repealed. What has taken the place of the rule since January of 2017? Is it by statute now? And if so, what statute? 
Are those funds still available, and if so, under what mechanism? Uh, nothing has uh, taken the place of uh, the effective rule uh, 65C-31.002. Um, however, that was uh, repealed uh, prospectively only. No, I understand that, but I'm just trying to understand this whole issue, and I know it's not in the brief, so if you don't know the answer, it's fine. You can just let me know. But it, I'm wondering if there is still currently, or since January of 2017, a program for someone uh, to apply for this educational funds. The Florida plan was approved for the years 2015 to 2019, and right now that is what it would be traveling under as far but as it for Florida. But that's been repealed since January of 2017? Uh, no, uh, Florida Administrative Code Rule 31.02 is what has been repealed, not the plan. There's not been no repeal of that by the federal government saying that no, it's not been, uh, and there's been nothing by Florida saying so what's that. So the, what's the state mechanism for implementation of that plan currently? By rule, by statute, or there is nothing that is implementing the plan? Uh, as of right now, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. It just seems very confusing to me. But go ahead with your argument. Uh, both sides do agree as far as that there is flexible funding for states to design and develop the programs as set forth in 677. Um, the appellant failed to meet the Florida ETV requirements as set forth in the Florida plan and 31.029A. Well, there's no, no dispute that she failed to meet the requirements. The question is whether or not the state could narrow the requirements um, uh, from what the, the Chafee Act provides. Right. And the Chafee Act in 677B2E does set, specifically set forth that the objective criteria for determining eligibility for benefits uh, is given to the states as long as they meet the uh, requirements of the plan that have to be approved by the federal government. And in this case, the federal government did approve Florida's plan for 2015 to 2019. Uh, and so the, go the government has said that, yes, in the state of Florida, these are the rules uh, and they have been approved. And it is done on a state-by-state -state basis for any state that wants to have ETV, then they have to uh, provide a program uh, plan to the uh, federal government, which then must approve it. And in this case, uh, the federal government did that. But she is, you agree, a youth who has aged out of foster care. She meets that definition under uh, the Chafee Act, yes? Yes, by a little over one month. Okay. But that is not under the Chafee Act. That is under the federal definition of uh, foster care, uh, which is uh, 45 CFR 1355. So if she, if she meets that definition, then why should the state be able to exclude her as eligible for benefits, as opposed to deciding how much of a benefit she might be entitled to? In other words, why not have a sliding scale? Why shouldn't the state, instead of being able to say, look, bright line rule, six months or less, you are, even though you aged out of foster care, um, six months or less, you're not eligible, as opposed to saying, well, if you aged out of foster care during a six-month period preceding your 18th birthday, you're eligible, but there will be a sliding scale of benefits that will apply to you. Why isn't that the, the, the right way that this should go, as opposed to what the state has done? That was addressed by the uh, federal government when it drafted 677B2E. Uh, when it stated that objective criteria for determining eligibility for benefits and services. So it gave to the states the, uh, that decided to uh, have a plan, it gave to the states the ability uh, to give objective criteria for determining eligibility. And that is not a matter of a sliding scale. So it isn't an arbitrary application as the opposition suggests, it's a discretionary application leaving to the states the decision on how to implement the statute, correct? I'm sorry? <laughs> Your opposing counsel, or the, uh, is it Mr. Lopez? Mr. Flores. Flores. Mr. Flores suggested Flores. that the application of the statute throughout the country would be arbitrary if it's simply left to the states to apply it any way that they want to and develop their own plans. But 2 sub e seems to suggest that really it's discretionary 
where the states have developed their own plan, correct? Correct. Uh, all of that for a simple answer. Uh, yes, it is um, up to each individual state. Uh, 677B uh, does leave it up to the states to formulate their own plan if they so desire, and that's because each state knows uh, how it would work in their system and in their uh, geographical and uh, so forth area as far as what their requirements are uh, for including in their system. And it, we are not concerned with the other 49 states. We are only concerned with Florida, and Florida it's six months and adjudication. Uh, and she has not met those requirements. Um, so each state is given the authority to create its own eligibility standards, and Florida has done it by the objective criteria that I have set forth, uh, and 135520 states that foster care includes but is not limited to placements in various shelters uh, what it specifically says, but is not limited to, and in this case, that is uh, what happened with um, the appellant, is that she was in non-licensed relative foster care. Uh, however, nowhere in 677A6 does it state that the federal ETV funds are for all youths who have aged out of foster care, no matter how long they were in the foster care system. It is unclear, and it does leave the deference or the power to the states to make that decision as set forth in Section B. It, it's similar. It's, it's exactly what Kern, what Kern um, addresses is whether or not there is that mandatory language, and if there isn't mandatory language. In Kern, the U.S. Supreme Court noted that, noted the general principle that um, states are free to set their own monetary standards of need and levels of benefits, but the states are not free to narrow the federal standards that uh, define the categories of people eligible for this aid. I mean, and that's, that's the argument of the appellant. But Quern then went further and examined whether those principles were to be applied to Illinois' emergency assistance to needy families and children um, under the the Social Security Act, and they concluded that because neither of the, of the statutes, um, the statute which makes AFDCA uh, and not emergency assistance eligibility criteria mandatory, or the statute which defines the permissible scope, neither one of those statutes contained that mandatory language. It simply contained permissible scope, and so the court found that because um, there wasn't this mandatory language and because Congress historically always left the states with broad discretion in shaping these programs, that Illinois could, in fact, um, participate in the program and limit uh, the standards of, of eligibility. Isn't that directly on point as to the our case, because there is no mandatory language, but a permissible scope, and because the, the rule itself, or actually the act itself, um, provides for the states to set that criteria, that the states do have this broad discretion in shaping the program and the eligibility, pro, uh, eligibility requirements for the state. Yes, Your Honor, that is precisely it. It is precisely on point, and that is what we argued in our briefs, uh, is that Quorn uh, does state that although uh, it, you cannot do it, the states cannot uh, create any narrowing of uh, requirements that are federal in origin, um, if there is mandatory language, the Chafee rule does supply the la that language that takes it out of being mandatory and leaves it to the state's individual powers and authorities and discretion uh, to narrow it or whatever because this, it goes one step further and says that uh, the federal government not only gives you that power, but the federal government gives a stamp of approval here and approves of your particular situation, Florida, and that, yes, uh, we have approved of your uh, narrowing and limitations on the requirements. And you thought my question was long? <laughs> Perhaps it's just you to the side. <laughs> 
So there has been no violation of the Fair and Equitable Treatment of Benefits Recipients Act either, uh, rule either, uh, because it was objective criteria. It was across the board that you have to be uh, six months in foster care before aging out, and you have to have been adjudicated dependent. And Your Honor was correct. As far as otherwise you could have, and, and Your Honor was correct, that otherwise you could have uh, someone who was in foster care for only one day. Uh, and, you know, it could have been that there were no, uh, no um, verified, that the allegations were not verified. Uh, and so then you have someone who went in the system for a day, maybe they just called because they were trying to get assistance, so they said this, uh, and so they may have been in there for one day, and then, and then uh, DCF says no, and the court says no, uh, you do not qualify for uh, foster care, go, go back to your parents for the rest of that one day, and that would not be uh, proper because the purpose of ETV is to provide those educational training uh, funds for uh, really for, for children who've been in that foster care situation and going to have no support system whatsoever, and they've been dependent on the state for a period of time, and therefore they don't want to just you know stop all the benefits that they've received as soon as they turn 18, and you know they're kicked out the door with absolutely no support system whatsoever. Exactly. Someone who would be disadvantaged by it. And in this case, she was not disadvantaged. It was for a little over a month. And furtherance, in, as far as not being disadvantaged, is that she is, uh, been, has been receiving a tuition fee waiver, uh, which and, is... And Medicaid assistance. And, and Medicaid, yes. Okay. So and she has been receiving Medicaid. Well I'm over sorry? Your time. And in conclusion, because you're well over your time. And in conclusion, the department did not err in denying its appellant's ETV application. There's been no adjudication in no six months, and therefore DCF respectfully requests that the court affirm the final order below. Thank you. Thank you. Briefly on rebuttal, Your Honors. First, to address the last point, it's not about the time that you were in foster care. It's about turning 18 in foster care, and then these benefits apply. Um, there is no proof of time requirements in the statute. And to say that Kalisha was not facing any hardships that Congress intended these ET vouchers to benefit, Kalisha faced homelessness when she aged out. That's why she had to go return home and then come back. She was abused then back at home and, and then came back to continue her education, which is exactly what the federal eligibility requirements go to, and then she was denied her ETV voucher. We'd also like to agree with Judge Emis that, yes, states can formulate their own plan. But uh, it does not exclude, it cannot, they cannot exclude the class of people that the federal government was intending to support here. And to your point, Judge Rothenberg, that it's true. Kalisha has the misfortune of timing here. Because right now, as we sit here today, the only applicable eligibility requirements to receive federal ETV in the state of Florida are the federal eligibility requirements under the Chafee Act, because DCF has repealed the rule. And what, what is the effect of that repeal? That's what I don't understand. Why is that relevant? Well, first of all, because there's no language that retroactively applies it, but I would think that, that you would not even want to be arguing about the repeal, because if it was repealed, there would have been no mechanism for her to have applied when she applied, and she would not be entitled to benefits, because there would be no existing program if it was repealed and it, it applied to her. No, Your Honor, if the, if the rule was applied, there would be no eligibility requirements set forth to ETV other than the federal eligibility requirements, which now that's, that is a, as how so it sits. So the plan would still be in existence. The plan would still it would be, be in just existence. the rule that would be. Correct. That's all that was repealed was the rule, not the plan itself. We're not asking okay. this court to invalidate the entire state plan. That's, that's not what we're asking. We're asking that the rule was invalid at the time it was applied to Kalisha, and it's invalid now. Has the, anything taken the place of that rule that was repealed, a statute? Not to, our, not, not to our knowledge, Your Honor, and as uh, the Florida State's Attorney came up as well, and, and they had, there was nothing there that's been applied either. And the ETV program is still in existence? It's still being used today? To our knowledge, Your Honor, if Kalisha applied today for federal ETV, it would be the federal eligibility requirements. Isn't that contrary to the federal statute, though? Because the statute requires a state plan in order to implement the benefit, correct? The federal statute requires a state plan in order to implement the programs that meet the purpose and the objective of the statute, not to exclude the class of people. They, like Judge Emis was referring to, you can 
allow someone like Kalisha, if the days are a problem for you, you can allow someone like under like Kalisha under the federal eligibility requirements to, to enter the pool and the class of people that are eligible. And then if there are some other mitigating circumstances that, that, that Florida wants to put on to say less it benefits the, or not. Does the submittal for the plan um, include eligibility requirements or was that only done by rule? Your Honor, as I stated before, that even if there were eligibility requirements in there and HHS doesn't have that type of deference by approval of the state plan to overrule the no, federal. No, I, no, but that's not my question. My question is, when the plan was submitted, did it include the same eligibility requirements that are included in, in the repealed rule? No, Your Honor. Did it have any difference. eligibility requirements? They, they did. They did not have um, that the child must be adjudicated dependent. And it talks about three separate programs in the plan, RTI, PES, and ETV, as Your Honor alluded to earlier. But in the section for basic ETV, which is what Kalisha applied to, it did not spell out any eligibility requirements for that specific section. Even in the intro section to the programs, and this is up to the record, Your Honor, on 104 and 105, even in the intro section where it laid out the general eligibility requirements in the state plan, the requirements it lists were different from the state rule, as Your Honor suggested. So the eligibility requirements in the submittal of the plan didn't include the dependency requirement, but did it include um, the six months foster care, licensed care um, we, we, requirement? No, not the six months and the, and the uh, licensed care. Pe the, the stuff that's applied to PES and RTI are different, but they're different programs than ETV. Well, I'm, I'm asking about the ETV program no. specifically. What were the requirements? were the requirements when the plan was submitted? The, the six months were in there or alluded to in the general provisions, but nothing specifically underneath the eligibility for basic ETV. It just laid out what the program were. But for were. any of these programs, these three programs within the plan, if you elected to receive benefits under any of the three programs, it would require the six months foster care. Um, it had that six month foster care requirement when you age out. You could allude to that from the intro section of the programs, but, but yes, Your Honor, nothing specifically under basic ETV uh, <clears throat> stated that. Your Honors, Kalisha is the quintessential beneficiary Congress intended these vouchers to support. DCF's decision to exclude her from ETV defeats the letter and the purpose of the federal law. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Mr. Flores, very good argument. You were clearly well prepared. Thank you.